So I'm going to start recording now. Um, Jillian, I'm glad you, I can always get a chuckle from you uh, when we're on the fly ad hocking things. So um, speaking of which, uh, everybody has the, the, the phenomenal cosmic power to unmute yourself. If you've got a question, though, I'd prefer that you send it along in the chat to Rob. There's going to be some natural breaking points uh, that, that'll make a little bit more sense to jump into the questions, but um, we're, we're a little, we kind of go with the flow here, so it's not, not too big of a deal. Um, so anyway, o over, the, over the course of the career, um, thought a lot about um, agility, why give a damn, and what, what's really the, some of the benefits that we should be looking for from a, maybe an entrepreneurial perspective. And in essence, uh, we, we kind of talked through this in a little bit more detail at the last people side of software, and I, and I gave a little bit of a talk around it at, at the end, but it was to help people um, kind of articulate to more of the business perspective of what, why be agile, what's in it for me? If I'm the owner of a company, why should I give a damn about what these agile coaches are telling me um, and how, what, what is the benefit going to be for me? So uh, we're, we're going to kind of rehash that, that conversation. So I apologize if, if any of you have seen part of this before, um, but we thought it would be great to, to just record it and get it out there um, so that it would be out there for, for more people to consume. So um, without further ado, I'm going to break into my iPad here and I'm going to be presenting it from here. So give me just a moment to share my screen. All right, fantastic. So I just want to quickly confirm that everybody can see my screen. Let's make sure everybody's a big old happy smiley face. Awesome. I've seen a lot of thumbs up. Fantastic. Instant feedback from the, from the group. Let me move this screen over just a little bit. All right, so let's get rid of that. So before the world went a little bit crazy, um, I, I traveled quite a bit for, for my job. So Rob and I, we travel between New York, LA, Seattle, and, and Chicago quite a bit. So I spend a lot of my time on the road. Um, I typically listen to about three hours of podcasts every day. Now it's at 1.5x, so it's probably closer to two hours. And then I like to read a lot of books. So I typically read about two books a month through my Audible account um, because I, I just enjoy listening more than I actually have a, a physical book. And so when we're thinking about agility and some of the benefits to it, I want to break it out of software for just a moment. And I want to think about if, you, if, if you're like me and you, you love reading, and let's say it's Christmas morning and you're coming down the steps and all of a sudden there's, there's four packages underneath the Christmas tree and they're four brand new books and you're equally excited about all four of these books. Maybe, maybe it's the next uh, George R. R. Martin book, The Winds of Winter. He's finally going to uh, let us know how that series was supposed to end. Uh, maybe it's the next Dresden File book um, and, uh, by, by Jim Butcher. And maybe, who knows, maybe it's the next Potterverse book doesn't really matter. Just go ahead and insert, insert the blank for yourself. But there's four books underneath that Christmas tree. Um, for a little bit of uh, ease of conversation, let's just pretend that all four of those books are equally the same size. So they're all about a thousand pages in duration or in, in size. And you are equally excited about all four of them. You think they're all going to be just as valuable to read. They're going to be just as entertaining to you. Um, just as exciting, just as enthralling as, as any of the other ones under that Christmas tree. So now the question that I have for you is, how would you go about reading those four books? Would you tear open all four and start reading a few sentences of the first book and then jump into the next book and read a page and then jump back to the first book and read a few sentences and then maybe go over to the third book and read a page or two and then maybe wander over to the fourth book and read a few sentences and just do that until you're all done with those four books? Or is it more likely that you would pick one and, and read it to completion and then move on to the next one? So a question for the crowd, how would you go about reading those four books? See and Joe saying one at a time. One at a time, of course. Megan's one at a time, excellent. So if you don't mind, if you're, if, th thank you for, for volunteering the, the feedback there. Why, why would you choose to read those books one at a time versus the other scenario that I was talking through? It allows me to give my undivided attention to a single piece of fiction or novel. Undivided attention. What does that do for you? Improves my focus, right? I don't get muddled details. I don't have to think through characters or plots um, because I'm not thinking of two or three or four different plots that I'm trying to work through. It's, it's a single plot, single set of characters. Awesome. So I saw a lot of head bobs from other people that, that are showing me their bright, shiny faces. What are some of the other reasons why you would choose to read one book at a time instead of reading all four?
it takes longer to finish one book if you're in progress on multiple. Okay, so I'm going to say the inverse of that is it would take less time. Mm -hmm. What other reasons? Your quality output would probably be a little bit higher as well. Okay, and if we're thinking about books, maybe we could say that your enjoyment factor is going to be a little bit higher. You're going to be able to get more out of that reading experience than if you were reading all four at the same time. Give me one more. What's one more reason why you would choose to read one book at a time instead of all four of them all at the same time? If I finish a book and I like it, I can then lend that book to someone else instead of needing to keep all four. Hmm. It would be physically difficult to manage four books while you're reading them. To turn the pages, to actually have them uh, physically. Awesome. So, um, Rachel, by the way, it's nice to see your face again. So, Rachel had thrown out there less cost of inventory is kind of what I was thinking about there. You could actually get rid of some of that, right? You could actually pass that along to somebody else to maybe get some more value. And then John was, was commenting around less difficulty to, to manage, right? Just overall, maybe it's less mentally burdensome to try and track four things all at the same time uh, versus just focusing on one thing. So you can likely catch where I'm starting to go with this, right? So really all we're talking about over here are qualitative reasons why a person might want to focus on one thing at a time instead of spreading their attention across numerous different things. Well, actually, one, one other thing in here is, um, is it feels good to finish. Uh, I, I like, oh my goodness. So two things I always joke around that you'll learn about me is I can't do math and I can't spell. And unfortunately, when I'm really put on the spot as, as a trainer, uh, that really just uh, uh, glorifies itself whenever I make spelling mistakes. So bear with me if, if I butchered words because it's going to happen. Uh, luckily, there's only a little bit of math in here and I normally get it correct, but um, there, there's even that to worry about in this presentation. But anyway, when we're talking about it feels good to finish, like we like checking the box. It mentally feels good to us. It literally releases a little bit of a dopamine hit inside of our brain. It's why we like completing things, why we like setting tasks to done, because it just feels good to us, okay? And so taking a step back again, all of these things here are more of the qualitative reasons around why we want to give focus, why we want to just do one thing at a time instead of doing multiple things at a time. And these same reasons will translate into why do we want to be agile to focus on getting a few things done instead of all the things all at the same time. But these are qualitative, right? Is there a way that we can quantitatively understand why this is actually, why we want to answer that question? Why give a damn about agility? All right, so let's take it out of the realm of, of books now and make it more applicable to organizations. And so let's paint up a hypothetical scenario where we have a number of big initiatives at our company. We wanna get them all done as soon as possible because there's money to be gained there. And this introduces the idea of cost of delay. Now, cost of delay is an interesting and, and a fairly deep topic, but I tend to oversimplify some things because I think it's just easier to, to grasp uh, and, and uh, uh, understand when you simplify ideas like this. And so the idea of cost of delay is something is only worth value when it's out there and ready for a customer to exchange a fistful of dollars for whatever your widget is. So the inverse of that is essentially the money you're missing out on because your goods or product or service or whatever isn't ready for them to consume. So if you've got a million dollar a month idea, right? This is a game changer of an idea for our organization. Once it's out there, we're gonna be able to reap a million dollars a month revenue from it. The inverse of that is every month that it is not out there, we are missing out on a million dollars a month revenue. In other words, we are incurring a million dollars a month cost of delay. So now let's apply that to our fictitious scenario here. And our company has four big initiatives that it's working on, right? It's got, oops, sorry. We've got initiative A, 
B, C, and D for just for simplicity. And each one of these is a game changer, all right? These are huge strategic initiatives for our organization. Now, a little bit of rainbows and unicorns in this conversation. We'll come back to those rainbows and unicorns in a bit. But for, for this conversation, we're just going to say each one of these is, is equally valuable as the next one. All right. So A, B, C, and D are each worth a million dollars a month once they're out there. And because we're going to be working on all of them together, it's going to take one year to complete all four initiatives. So just kind of drawing out a timeline here of each uh, of what this is going to look like for the year as we're working on each one of these initiatives. All right. So now each initiative is worth a million dollars a month, all right? which means each initiative, when it's not out there, is incurring a cost of delay of a million dollars a month. So by the end of the year, for all four initiatives, we're going to incur a $48 million cost of delay. Right? So let's draw that out. Right. So we spent 12 months building A, so we lost out on $12 million. We lost out on $12 million for B, C, and D, right? So over here at the end of the year, we lost out on $48 million, all right? So now, again, rainbows and unicorns, let's pretend that as an organization, we decided to say, you know what? Let's just focus on getting one thing to done first. Let's take all of our resources, all of our people, all of our finances, everything that we have at our disposal, and focus simply on getting A to done before we move on to B. Now again, a little bit of rainbows and unicorns in this conversation, and we will come back to the rainbows and unicorns. Hypothetically, how long do you think it would take for us to finish A? If you're trying to do them all over the course of a year, you split them up into four parts, four independent projects, singularly focused, you can, you can make an easy math guess about four months. Now, does that really work out that way? Probably not, but that's a good starting point, right? Awesome. I'll take it, right? So Joe, lots of rainbows and unicorns inside that statement, right? Fair, fair enough. So hypothetically, we could say it's probably going to take about a quarter of the time because we've stopped spreading all of our time, resources, people, et cetera, finances across all of these different things. And now we're just gonna focus on A. All right, so let's draw that out, right? So A goes for three months. So we lose out on $3 million. But now it's January, February, March, April 1st rolls around. So what magically happens on April 1st? Aside from it being April Fool's Day, right? That starts making money. That starts making money. Exactly. So it's no longer incurring a cost of delay. It's actually generating uh, value for the organization. And it continues to generate value now for the rest of the year. Right? So now we generate $9 million. So at the end of the year, we have a cost of delay of three, but we're up by nine. Right? So we're professionals. We finished A on April 1st. What should a professional do in that type of situation? Move on to B. Move on to B. Sounds legitimate to me, right? So let's draw that out. So we spent three months on A. We spent three months building B. So we incur a cost of delay of $6 million, right? Nothing was out there. Nothing was generating money for us. But now again, magically, what is that? January, February, March, April, May, June. July 1st is what it would be. Fantastic. Now it's out there. Now it's generating, oops, $6 million for us this year. Same thing. Then we move on to C, right? So we had six months, we were working on A and then B, then we go on to C for three months. So we lose out on nine. We get three. And you can see how this kind of plays out, right? So at the end of the year, poor D, we don't make any money on it because we were always working on something else. We moved on to D. Now at the bottom, we lose out on that full $12 million, right? But let's add this up. So plus 18 million minus 30, the same thing as 48 across the board. And now the question is, which would you rather be? 
Would you rather be the company that made $18 million this year or lost out on a total of 48? Now, if I was the owner of that company, I would want to be this one. If I was the employee of that company, I would likely want to be this one, all right? So, and by the way, not only did we make more money this year, but we also had all of these other things that went along with it. We had undivided attention. Our employees had better focus. It took less time, and we just showed that here, right? Our quality was better. There's less cost of inventory. There's less difficult to manage, and it felt good to actually finish things. So from both a qualitative and quantitative perspective, it makes more business sense for us to simply limit the things that we are working on and get things done sooner so we can realize the value of these things sooner, okay? This is basically just reducing your time to market, all right? You can do this by working 80-hour work weeks maybe, all right? Or you could just start less and finish more, okay? Now, I wanna be careful with what I'm trying to, to articulate here. The goal of this conversation is not to say only ever work on one thing at a time, okay? You might be familiar with whip limits and just saying that's only how many things we're going to be working on at a time, right? Limiting your whip and process or work in process is a good thing. But your whip limit is also your signal to pull, okay? And it's very oftentimes not going to be set at one. You're likely going to be capable of doing two, three, four things at a time. You will need to find that number. But the point being is that it's very likely less than the number of things that you are working on today, okay? This math would still work out if we just chose to do two things at a time instead of all four things. This number would just happen to be $12 million up instead of 18 million, okay? So again, less is generally better for you when you're thinking about time to market and how many things you're able to get done. Now, one last thing about this. In this hypothetical scenario that I was talking about, we were thinking about A, B, C, and T as big organizational initiatives that the entire company was taking on and all working on at the same time. But this could just as easily be your scrum team's sprint backlog. If on day one of your sprint, all seven things magically go into in process or working on or doing whatever state that happens to be, and then a day or two before the end of the sprint, they all magically go into done, you have just incurred a cost of delay. This same concept turtles all the way down to your teams and the things that your team is working on versus your organizational whip and all the big strategic initiatives that you are working on all at the same time, all right? So this concept applies at every level of your organization. All right, so this is the first slice of the awesomeness of agility, right? Of, of, of why you would give a damn from a, a CEO uh, level why you want to be agile. And now, before I break into the second place, I want to stop for a moment. And Rob, if there were any questions that came in or if there's anything we want to tackle before I move into the next section. Uh, I got no new questions from the chat. Awesome. That gives me a moment to get a drink here. Pause, take in everybody's face just to make sure there's no additional questions before I move on. Fantastic. So let's move on now to the second half of this conversation, all right? So let's draw, a, in contrast, waterfall development versus any type of agile development. Likely it's Scrum or maybe Kanban, we, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. They're, they're going to give you the same thing. And so we've been talking about value quite a bit here, right? This whole conversation was talking about cost of delay. How can we reduce our time to market by simply giving us focus and reducing our whip, et cetera. But value is determined from the perspective of your customer. It is not until you're able to take that widget or whatever you're producing and give it to a customer and they exchange it for a fistful of dollars that value is realized at an organization. Up until that point, it is simply whip in your system. It is inventory and you're paying an inventory cost to that. But if we were to visualize that value and what that looks like in typical waterfall, we would see, or, sorry, let me label my axis here and make it a little bit easier. So we'll say time and value. So waterfall typically takes a very long time with a low amount of value and then at the very end, 
we shoot up in value, right? Because we're finally releasing all that whip that we've been working on for the past, who knows, six months, six years, six decades, doesn't really matter, right? That big batch delivery, we're finally releasing it to a customer. And at this point, we skyrocket in the amount of value that we're delivering to them, all right? So now let's contrast that with really any type of agile delivery process or framework, all right? is we just have an incremental delivery of value over time, all right? So that each step of the way, each little slice, we're delivering value to a customer. So again, let's kind of visualize this and what it would look like. Again, it doesn't really matter whether you're using Scrum or Kanban, any of these agile processes frameworks will give you this. But somewhere, excuse me, somewhere there's a list of work, all right? And we'll represent that list, oops, excuse me, as a, as a product backlog here. We've got a list and all this cool stuff for our customers are on there. And I'm gonna talk about it from a Scrum perspective. So I'm gonna use product backlog here quite a bit. Um, a product backlog is ordered by value, all right? So that the things at the top of your product backlog are more valuable than the things at the bottom of your backlog. And we should be thinking about a quantitative way to measure that. So the things at the top are worth, let's just say 100 value points and then 99, then 98 value points, et cetera all the way down to three, two, one on our product backlog, all right? So should make sense. Things at the top are more valuable than the things at the bottom. And so we've got an awesome development team. Maybe we have lots of development teams. So they're rocking and rolling and they're gonna produce the first release of this product. And for simplicity, we're just gonna say, it's this big chunk of work right here. And we're gonna call this release one, all right? So now we can jump up back over to here and we can draw this fictitious release line and we'll just put it right there. Fantastic. We've created our release one. We put it in front of a customer. It's starting to get value, right? And we can actually visualize that value right here. So if we drew a line directly over, highlighted all of this, this is now value that we are recognizing and bringing into the organization. We're no longer having to wait until this time horizon we brought it all the way over to here, and now all of the shaded area is value that we are realizing. In other words, this is simply another way of visualizing the cost of delay that we are no longer paying, right? Because we're no longer waiting until this time horizon, we've moved it over to here, and significantly earlier in our development process, we are realizing the dollars and cents for it because it's done, we have released it out to a customer, okay? So right now, all we're doing is revisiting and re-illustrating cost of delay, okay? And that's pretty good. So what happens after the first sprint review or the first release, fantastic. We've gotten all this work done. Now, naturally, we're gonna go on and start looking at the next stuff on our product backlog. Drew that a little bit too close. Let me move it over just a little bit. Awesome. And so now on our product backlog, we just finished all of this cool stuff up here at the end of release one. So now we need to start moving on to release two stuff. And let's just say it was maybe the top 30 things on our product backlog for release one. So now our top most product backlog item is gonna be something like 69, 68, 67, et cetera, all the way down to three, two, one, all right? So now let's make our second release of our product. This will become R2. And let's come visualize what this looks like. So pretend that our time horizon is the same here. And when I say that the time horizon is the same, what I mean is the time between release one and release two is the same. So it might be a little bit off, but imagine it's the same for sake of conversation, All right? So we just put out our release two out into the market. And just like at the beginning of, or at the end of release one, we started realizing all this dollars and cents of the organization. Now we're doing the same thing for R2, right? So now we have a combined value input of R1 plus R2. That's all value being brought in as of this time horizon. Same thing, cutting down the cost of delay from being way out here to now being over here. What are you noticing about release one versus release two? First of all, there's a smaller gap between the, the, the value delivered in release two and what you would ultimately get in a traditional waterfall approach. So as you get closer to that end date projected by a waterfall project, 
uh, the value delivering is incrementally smaller with each increment uh, of delivery in an agile methodology, whether it's Kanban or Scrum, but, but the, the value you receive is diminished. Yeah, yeah. So, so let, let me just, is, oh, a little bit, awesome, awesome Joe, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna draw this one more time. So a hypothetical release three, you can start to see more and more of how much less value is being delivered every release of this product, right? And so that's exactly what, what Joe was, was talking to here. So let me undo those lines real quick. And let's just jump back down here to our backlogs, right? This should inherently make sense to us. If we have a list of 100 things and it is um, ordered by value, the things at the top are going to be more valuable than the things at the bottom. So when we do those, by definition, the next things we're going to be doing are less valuable and thus will deliver less value to a customer, all right? Now, if we just kept doing this, I like to highlight this as inspecting and accepting. This is we're going to inspect the work done and simply accept it and move on, okay? But what happens when you give something to a customer? Every time, in some way, shape, or form, what do they do? Oh, Joe, you're on mute. Uh, they, they want more. They want to edit or alter, adapt what you've already done to, to something new in the market or a new requirement that's come to light based on what they've seen. Awesome. So I'm going to take that and just rephrase it a little bit. In other words, they give you feedback. In some way, shape, or form, every time you give something to a customer, they are going to give you some feedback. And that is fantastic, okay? So in, let's, let's jump in the DeLorean, hit 88 miles per hour, and go back to the end of release one here in this hypothetical scenario. So I'm going to take our release one backlog, and I'm just going to copy it, paste it right on over here. And now that I've got some good space, I'm just going to move everything over just a little bit. All right. So now we're at the end of our release one, all right? We give it to a customer. And like Joe was just saying, they give us some feedback. They want to change this. They give us some more acceptance criteria. They've changed direction, whatever the case may be. We take that information. We take that feedback. And now we adapt to it. We reorder a product backlog. We repopulate a product backlog. So in essence, we've got our new list of stuff over here. And in fact, just to make a little bit more room, I'm going to delete that out. And instead of going and working on number 69, 68, and 67, we're going to repopulate the backlog with new cool stuff that our customers say they would find more valuable than the things we would have been working on. Maybe it's just as valuable as the things that were, excuse me, originally there. Maybe it's a little bit less, but the point being, it's always going to be the thing of the highest value to our customer. So maybe it's something like a 98, then maybe a 95, then maybe a 92, excuse me, all the way down to three, two, one, all right? Now, let's make a new, eh, let's do whatever this color is, gold. Let's make a new release two of our product. So now, we would start to see something more like this. And then doing the same thing, inspecting and adapting at the end of R2. Now we build another one. And then inspecting and adapting at the end of R3 and R4 and R5, et cetera. And so ultimately, what this is doing is highlighting the fact that if you think you're going to arrive at the same place, regardless of whether you're doing waterfall or agile development, that should be a bold-faced lie. The way you will wind up at that situation is by simply inspecting and accepting. In other words, if you just want to follow the plan. So at your annual planning, you know, the financial budgeting meeting that you come up with in September, October, somewhere around that time frame, and you say, here's all the things that we want to build next year. And you just build out your plan and you execute according to the plan for the next six months, the next, next 12 months. And it's more about following the plan instead of responding to change, you will get here. Now, this is where most organizations fall flat because they see that they're, that they're significantly cutting down their time to market. And that's a great thing. 
that is still very valuable. But what they are missing is the responding to change, the inspecting and the adapting, okay? That is how you get that fiction, I shouldn't say fictional, that mystical 10x growth. It's by consistently um, working on and delivering to a customer the highest value item, which consists that will ensure, well, I shouldn't say ensure, that optimizes the amount of value that you are consistently delivering to a customer with each release. Because essentially, if you don't do that, by definition, each one of your releases will be worth less. All right. So this is kind of the other superpower of agility and what it gives you. The first part is significantly reducing your time to market, or in essence, cutting down your cost of delay. The second one is maximizing the amount of value that you're delivering to a customer over time so that each one of these releases to a customer is always maximizing value. And it becomes less about following the plan and more about responding to change, which if, if you're into systems thinking, is the systems optimization goal of agility is to be responsive. It is to be adaptive, right? It is not about efficiency. It is about responding to change in order to maximize value delivery to a customer. These are the reasons why organizationally we should give a damn about agility, right? This is the dollars and cents behind why we want to go through this agile transformation or this change or whatever buzzword you want to throw at it, right? Because business that have figured this out are the titans of industry today. And this is where so many other organizations are struggling and falling down. So with that, what questions do you have for me? Yeah, how do you actually convince uh, product managers and stakeholders that uh, you know this is, this is a better way to go? You can explain this and you can show the graphs, uh, but ultimately what this is doing is taking, they, they feel it's taking away some of, uh, some of their decision-making process. Uh, that's what I've run into as far as, as far as points in my organization. Uh, I, I work as a product owner mm -hmm. um, and I've run into, you know, with the founder uh, when we try to approach this iteratively and I've explained that, you know, if we do it like this, um, we're now rearranging our product backlog and we're building things that people actually want, not just six months worth of work that you think they want. And then we give it to them and it's not actually what they wanted at all. Um, but he feels that that brings the decisions away from them and he knows best or they know best for the company anyway. How do you, I guess, how do you get around that? Right. So, um, no, no silver bullet, uh, by the way, Jason, thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoy bringing data to as many of the conversations as I can to help influence that or drive that discussion. And so that's one of the reasons I called out at the beginning of this is we should be having some sort of quantifiable way to measure value delivery. Okay. And once we have a little bit of data, it's, it's sh should be easier to have the conversation and say, well, let's just plot this out. Here's our dollars and cents of what we've got on a product backlog today. Here's what it would look like at the end of R1. And again, if all we did was follow the plan, we're going to continually deliver less and less value to a customer. So as the owner, do you want to start delivering less value to a customer over time? Now, there is a little bit of control that the illusion um, of control that you're giving up in this, but the other part of what you were bringing up was, hey, instead of having to wait and only be able to make big decisions every quarter, would you like to be able to make bigger decisions more frequently? Maybe that's every month. Maybe that's every few weeks, because that's actually giving you more control of the throttle, more control of the steering wheel to make the changes that you want to see in order to drive the business outcomes that you're expecting from doing this right? The, the goal isn't Scrum. The goal isn't Kanban. These are just tools to tactically help you achieve the outcomes that you're going after. And so, Jason, maybe part of the conversation is just, what is your goal? And not you, but your, your, your boss, your leadership. What is the goal that they're trying to go after? And then once we can align on a goal, what are the guardrails that we get to put in place? Where's the autonomy to respond to change inside of this, right? As an example, a lot of the organizations that I've been talking with, you know, back uh, a month and a half, two months ago, they threw away all of their roadmaps, right? All of the strategic plans that they had for 2020 were figuratively and sometimes literally ripped up and thrown into the garbage bin 
right? And that was a big, massive change. Was it hard? Was that stressful? Well, what if we were able to do that in an hour every two weeks, right? How much time would we save overall and how much focus would that give back into actual deliver value for a customer versus all of the, um, let's say, bureaucratic processes we have in place today to try to control change instead of reacting and adapting to change. So not, not a silver bullet solution, Jason, by any stretch of the imagination. This is a difficult conversation, but I would drive towards what are you really trying to get out of this conversation? You being the, the leadership team, you being the CEO, and how can we bring data to that conversation to help make data informed decisions and not just data dictated decisions? What other questions from anybody do we have? How many more questions am I allowed? Jason, nobody else is talking, man. It's all you. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm, I'm new to the product owner role. And our company, we started as a startup a couple years ago, and we're actually new to adopting Agile. So, some, awesome. uh, some questions from that. Um, what we're finding out right now is that we are now getting to the size that larger clients are um, starting to come in and ask us about our products. Um, and they're starting to get some pretty robust uh, requirements gathering for whether they're going to adopt our, we run a software as a solution for them uh, in, in their shops. Uh, one of those things that they want is a year long development roadmap. How do we talk big name clients who could potentially bring a, a ton of revenue for us in here? Um, how, how do we explain to them that it's hard to give them a year long roadmap when that's constantly evolving and changing basically every month? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this was always the fun part of, so that I mentioned earlier, I was a product owner for about eight years. I was involved in just about every pre-sales opportunity, um, before getting to, to work with bigger clients. And I mean, I'm from the Milwaukee area, uh, lots of the clients have gotten to, to work with have Milwaukee in the name. Some of them are sports related. Some of them are power tool related. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they, they liked having a good idea of where, where we were going. And this, again, is driving to what, what's the goals. So hypothetically, asking a customer, let's just pretend we did all the stuff that is on this backlog. All the requirements were successfully fulfilled, um, but nobody brought, bought your product. Would this be a successful project for you? And likely the answer is going to be hell no. Of course not. We want people to, to be buying our product. We're supposed to be delivering value. Excellent. So now we're saying it's more important for us to achieve the outcomes that this backlog is supposed to help us achieve versus doing all the work. So we're making a lot of assumptions in this backlog. You're asking us for a year's worth of work, right? Wouldn't it make sense if we were able to test some of this stuff earlier as we're actually developing it to, again, make sure that we're actually moving and making progress against those goals and those outcomes that you, that you want to achieve? In essence, having less focus on what we have to do, but why we're doing it and the outcome that, that we're going after. All right. So trying to drive that conversation towards goals, towards outcomes is, is definitely going to be beneficial for you. Um, one of the other approaches that we often used was great. A lot of times a, a bigger organization wants to control its risk to a certain degree. And we can say, hey, absolutely. Let's talk about how we might be able to build a contract to work with you in a, a little bit more responsive way. So let's say instead of locking you in for a year's worth of work, we only set up our contracts to be for a month at a time. And as long as we keep developing stuff for you that you would like, that you enjoy, great. We're just going to keep going one month at a time. But if at any point you decide you don't like it, or hey, maybe even we, did, we decided we didn't need all of this other stuff, uh, we put something in there. Maybe you can just stop with 30 days notice. Maybe um, you can stop early and whatever the remaining length of that contract is, you, we split the difference. You only owe us 50%. Um, there's a lot of interesting conversations that you can have in agile contracting uh, or kind of beyond budgeting discussions around building something that's more of a win-win. One of the biggest things that I had to articulate with clients was essentially if somebody's coming in the door and saying that we're going to build all of this scope and all of this time for this amount of budget, uh, they're really just professionally lying to you. Uh, this is what I'd have to tell cu customers. Anybody who is telling you that is 100% bullshitting you. All right? There is no way that anybody could tell you exactly how long all of this stuff is going to take. And these were typically bigger initiatives that I was working on, anywhere from six months to two years in size, right? Nobody has that crystal ball. 
So let's find a better way of building a working relationship with you so that you can help control your risk, we can control our risk, and then that conversation becomes a win-win conversation. And another way I've, I've articulated is fixed time budget scope is always a win-lose situation, right? It's always win for one party and lose for another party, right? The customer might think, hey, I've got all this stuff. It was delivered on time, scope, and budget. I guarantee you were overcharged for that work or what you received was of, of, of poor quality because that's the only way you can get those constraints to work in that type of environment, right? So anyway, I, I, sorry, just kind of word vomit, but a, a bunch of ideas there that I would explore around. Is there better ways of setting up the, the contractual agreement that you're going after? Maybe thinking about that as a backstop, maybe thinking about, is there a way that we don't actually uh, lock our customers in for huge chunks of money um, and be a little bit more adaptive with how we work with them and really build strong partnerships versus um, transactional uh, partnerships uh, with, with our clients and customers? Got one from the uh, audience. Go for it. So the question is, uh, where to go here? Um, can you explain how these same values slash principles scale to epics or larger epics? Or is it assumed that you were doing the right thing at the micro level? Uh, it translates to good macro outcomes. So can this can these ideas be applied basically at, at larger scale at, at epic level sort of things? Or is it just micro and we assume it bubbles up? Yeah. And so I, I'm going to I'm going to kind of jump back to this and I, I mentioned rainbows and unicorns earlier. And so if I don't answer this question in particular, please feel free to, to jump in and articulate a little bit more or ex expand on a little bit more. The, the pushback that I often get to this is, yeah, Jeff, that, that makes sense. But you know, nine women can't make a baby in a month, you know? And I say, you are absolutely correct. And thank God we're not making babies, okay? We're, we're building products, okay? Not babies. So there's, you're, you're taking a little bit of a, a other domains and bringing them in. And, and so where I'm going with this is even in your everyday life, um, if you think about when things get really chaotic and things get really hectic and you're, you're running all around, um, I've, I've caught myself doing this, you know, but in your mind, you just, you, you say, whoa, slow down, just one thing at a time, okay? We inherently realize that when we start doing lots of things, things very quickly become chaotic. And it's easier for us to focus on getting something to the done before we move on to the next. And so to, to go really back to your question, does this scale? Does this apply all the way down at the team level to the individual level of the things that I'm working on all the way up to the, the portfolio, the epics, the themes that are, that are going on in an organization? Absolutely. The what we are working on isn't really, uh, isn't important. What it's really boiling down to is time. You have a set, amount of time and you divide that between all the things that you're working on, right? So if you're working on one thing in 24 hours, hypothetically, it gets 24 hours of attention. If you're working on two things, now each thing gets 12 hours of attention. So time is a constant inside of this, right? The number of things that you are adding to the list break apart the amount of time that you have to spend on things. And that same principle applies as Jeff, the individual and the things that I'm working on versus Jeff Incorporated and all the things we are collectively working on because time is the same. It's a 24 hour time limit. It's just the things that we are working on slice up the amount of attention we can give things. So the more slices you have, the more things you're working on, the longer those things will take to actually complete. Got a few minutes left. Any, any other questions, comments, concerns? Got some great comments. There are people are very happy and thanking uh, you for your presentation. Oh man, I feel like a jerk wad. Um, I meant to start out with this and I apologize. Um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for coming. Um, I, speaking of time, uh, you, everybody only has so much of it in their life. You could have been doing just about anything, but you chose to take this hour out of your lunch and come and listen to me and, and Rob. And I'm humbled and, and really uh, grateful that you, you, you chose to, to come and, and, and listen over lunch. So I do appreciate that. And I Rob. just had some last minute uh, things. Uh, I also thank you for coming. We're, we're happy you're getting some value out of this. We got a great turnout from all the people that responded. Um, we, can, we plan to keep doing this. So expect something either every other week or every month on this. Um, we're gonna try to keep cranking out great topics and, and just keep you guys interested. 
So um, if you're interested in having us do this as a lunch and learn in your organization privately, we're more than happy. Just reach out, info at responseadvisors.com. Uh, we're very easy to find, just Google us. Um, what else? Uh, we've got the meetup, I mentioned that. We've got the YouTube channel, Response Advisors YouTube. There's lots of ways you can see the, the content that we're putting out there. And, and of course, if you're interested in um, any kind of agile transformation work, assessments, audits, or training classes, again, we're easy to find. There's, there's plenty of stuff out there, uh, ways we can help you guys. So again, thanks for coming. Awesome, thanks all, Jillian, Rachel, Matt, good to see you three again, and, and everybody else, but especially you three. So hope life is amazing for all three of you. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it, Jeff. Awesome. This isn't a dream, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.